Academy of Religion. She is an internationally known theologian. She's at the forefront of Asian and Asian American feminist theology and post-colonial theology. And she is the author or editor of numerous books, both in English and in Chinese. It would take the whole evening, friends, to review her resume, but even that would only begin to scratch the surface. To many of you, Dr. Kwok is a beloved teacher. To others, she is a wise mentor, a pioneering thinker, a wise collaborator. I've been fortunate enough to get to know her and work with Dr. Kwok in recent years, and I have found her to be inexhaustibly creative and unfailingly gracious. She has quickly become, for me, a model of a scholar whose work can exist and thrive in both the academy, but also in the public arena. By the force of her spirit and the depth of her relationships, uh, Dr. Kwok has the ability to convene extraordinary networks of individuals literally across the globe. I had a chance to see this firsthand last spring when Dr. Kwok orchestrated a short course on Asian and Asian American feminist theology through the Candler Foundry. I suspect that many of you or some of you were there for that class. Not only was Dr. Kwok able to entice an all-star lineup of instructors to participate, but she also appealed to a stunning range of students, literally from across the world. Not only, uh, uh, we had planned on our end for about 40 students, uh, uh, and a few days out from the beginning of the class, we had 500 signed up. And that, I remember writing to Dr. Kwok that, that this was a problem, but a problem of the very best sort to have. The book that is launching today is not just a scholarly volume, it's really an expression of Dr. Kwok's life, her calling, her way of being in the world, and her hope for the church. Dr. Kwok, we are so pleased to be here with you. Thank you for sharing this book and so much of yourself with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bonfilio, for moderating this session. I am very grateful to all of you who joined me tonight or for you in the morning from Europe, from Asia, from the United States and Canada and other parts of the world. I am very grateful to Kendra Foundry and Pan Autumn for sponsoring this book launch. It takes a village to produce a book. And many of you have been joining my own intellectual and professional journey for a very long time. Others, I hope I have the opportunity to collaborate with you and learn from you. I also want to thank Dr. Nami Kim and Dr. Tracy West for taking part in this book launch. Now this book was brought together in the midst of Hong Kong protests, the COVID pandemic and Black Lives Matters protests in the US. As I was watching public protests, both in Hong Kong and in the US, I felt the need to gather some of my writings together and expand them to address the changing geopolitical situation in Asian Pacific. I have three guiding concerns when I chose the essays to be included in this book. The first one, how do we conceptualize political theology in post-coloniality? Should we begin with the German jurist Karl Schmitt, who wrote the book Political Theology in 1922? When you opened many textbooks on political theology, those books always started with Karl Schmitt. Now, should we improve theological voices in the anti colonial era? How do we discern where is the line between colonial and post-colonial? How can we develop a comparative political theology that addresses religious plurality in Asia and beyond? Here, I benefit from my colleague, John Tatamano's book, Circling the Elephant. He says that the field of theology and philosophy of religion have not taken seriously the contributions of Asian religious traditions. He challenges us to think with Asian religious traditions, 
and not just to think about them. Taking up his challenge, how can we rethink some of the categories in political theology, such as secularism, sovereignty, and governmentality? Break these concepts open and expand them. How can we think with Asian and other religious traditions in order to look at race, class, gender, sexuality, and deal, so that we can go beyond Eurocentric framework of analysis? Because in the book, I argue that post-colonial politics can't be limited to the discussion of state, sovereignty, government, and political economy. Why, if we only focus on those, we will leave out the voices of women, of the subalterns, of marginalized people, of sexual minorities. Because many of them did not have and still do not have the opportunity to participate in leadership of state or as uh, government officials. Therefore, I argue that we must expand the understanding of post-colonial politics and pay attention to the ways that race, class, gender, and sexuality have been reconfigured through colonial encounter because colonization changed social patterns and disrupted traditional gender relations. Thinking with the diversity of religious and cultural traditions in the US also helps us understand how white Christian privilege undergirds white nationalism. As Kelly Brown Douglas has pointed out, American exceptionalism is shaped by the Anglo-Saxon myth that came to America through the pilgrims and Puritans who provided this myth with religious legitimation. Black Lives Matter protest shows the deep-seated anti-Blackness in American society. And this racism draws from religious and cultural roots and myths. My second concern has something to do with Sino-American competition. Many of you know that I was born in the former British colony of Hong Kong. That is why when we have this witnessed intense competition, if not rivalry between China and the United States, I was deeply concerned. For me, it was very difficult to watch the Hong Kong protest without thinking back to the student protest when I was a college student in Hong Kong in the 1970s. It was difficult because in the 70s, students protested against the British colonial government. The slogan at the time was, know about the motherland and be concerned about the society. I recall that some of the leaders in the student unions will dress like the young people in cultural revolution with the Mao suit and then um, with the uh, uh, green head uh, with a star. So I recall that so vividly when I was watching the television showing the Hong Kong protest. Almost 50 years later, students and people in Hong Kong this time protested against the Hong Kong and Beijing government. Protesters appealed to the international community for help. They even appealed to President Donald Trump and the US government. Though we in the US have been criticizing Trump's bigotry, misogyny, and anti-immigrant stance. To tease out the complexity of Sino-American relations, I look back at American involvement in Asian politics 
since the late 19th century to gain a longer historical view. I argue for a transnational approach to political theology in Asia and Pacific that goes beyond national history and politics. For the stereotypical myths of yellow peril and model minority were developed at critical junctures of changing relations between Asia and the US. We can't understand the present anti-Asian violence without tracing back to these historical roots. I especially want to thank Dr. Nami Kim and Dr. N. Cho for their co-edited volumes on American militarism and imperialism in Asian Pacific. My third concern has something to do with this question. How might post-colonial theology and biblical studies incarnate in the lives of Christian communities? Without this incarnation, post-colonial theology would only remain an academic discourse. Now it is hard to practice post-colonial theory of theology within Christian community. But I am very grateful because since the 2010s, I have had the opportunity to be invited to dialogue and speak with theological field educators, past, pastoral and practical theologians, and homiliticians. Therefore, the book includes a final session with several chapters that explores teaching global theology for the education of global leaders, preaching in intercultural context, religious solidarity and peace building, and the need to reimagine Christian mission and planetary politics in the age of Afropocene. As I was completing this book, I asked, facing the pandemic, the Hong Kong protest, and rising Sino-American competition, where can I find hope? Here, I benefit from the scholarship of Dr. Tracy West, because in her work, she talks about hope is a process. Indeed, post-colonial hope is much like a process, but we cannot defer hope till eternity. Dr. West writes, defiant spirituality gives birth to hope. Hope is a process means that we cannot rely on any single individual or hero to save us out of the blue. Hope must be embodied and practiced in community in order to develop resilience for the long haul. As empire seeks to instill fear, helplessness, and fatalism, defiant communities must teach each other and the young how to nurture hopefulness as a daily ritual as a practice. Finally, I want to th thank my research assistant, Ryan Washington, because when I asked him to edit the manuscript, he put so many comments and questions on the margin. Without those promptings, I would not have the opportunities to clarify my own thought and use more precise language. I am very grateful to my editor at Westminster John Knox, Julie Mullins, a very experienced editor. She helped me to conceptualize the book, to pull the different chapters together and read it so carefully and asking me clarifying questions and helping me to make the book even more coherent. I want to thank Julie Tolini, who oversees the production of the book. This is 
wonderfully produced. And I hope this will be a little gift for all of you who are thinking about where is home? Where is the world heading? How I or our faith community can be that part of God's people that will bring the beacon of hope in this season of turmoil and stress. Thank you very much for joining this book launch. It means a lot to me. Well, Dr. Kwok, thank you so much for sharing those reflections and framing uh, the book further for us. It, it makes the book all the more enticing and uh, you leave us with some incredible words of wisdom to bring us into this conversation. Um, I wanna turn now to our first respondent. Our first respondent tonight is Dr. Tracy C. West. Dr. West is the James W. Pearsall Professor of Christian Ethics and African American Studies at Drew University Theological School. Her books include Solidarity and Defiant Spirituality, Africana Lessons on Religion, Race, and Ending Gender Violence, as well as Disruptive Christian Ethics, When Racism and Women's Lives Matter. Dr. West, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. And I want to say congratulations to Dr. Kwok, who uh, I love how you ended with gift. This book is indeed a gift. Um, so I am expressing my gratitude to you for the gift of this book and also for all the ways uh, you have been just an important person in my life as an insightful thinker upon whose work I depend, I rely upon, and also a mentor. Uh, I was a student in your class many decades ago at Union Theological Seminary and uh, also as a friend. I just have a few brief remarks and look forward to the conversation. So what I wanna say is post-colonial theory is supposed to be opaque to the majority of scholars, right? It, it's supposed to be an intellectual space where only the most elite academic thinkers can dwell. They speak when they gather in that intellectual space. They speak its obtuse language of deconstructive global geopolitics and linguistically very dense symb symbolism to represent thousands of years of cultural adaptations and exploitative economic histories, even while this theory claims to be uh, somehow concerned with the centering of colonized peoples, the centering of marginalized perspectives. That's what it's supposed to be. This is an unspoken rule that Dr. Kwok Pui Lan has broken has broken with this text, post-colonial politics and theology, describing this scholarly work as accessible, doesn't even begin to capture what I mean by how Dr. Kwok has broken that rule. I feel like the whole text, it's an invitation. I just constantly feel invited to come and just chat. First of all, come and chat with Dr. Kwok about her own personal, intellectual, political journey. Come and chat with a really wide range of cultural theorists and theologians in order to study intersecting meanings of theology and coloniality and sexuality, namely queerness, and ecology and other pressing intersections through Dr. Kwok's critical, often narrative, 
vantage point. Now, I want to note the critiques of scholars that are throughout this text as we're chatting with them that point out gaps, that point out narrowness, also include appreciation for how the thinker has provoked her thinking. Even as she offers the critique, there's always this sense of appreciation. Now that, that is a method of critique that I want to teach, that I need to teach, that this text allows us to teach. So rather than obtuse dis distancing, I feel an invitation to, as, as uh, Dr. Kwok defines the post-colonial imagination, quote, to a desire, a determination, and a process of disengagement from the whole colonial syndrome, which takes many forms and guises, unquote. Moreover, in the realm of how this book breaks with what is supposed to be, I am reminded of how I sometimes find myself taken off guard when I hear students and colleagues alike, not just students, students and colleagues alike, say a version of, I study post-colonialism or I teach post-colonial theory, not racism like you, Tracy. Not racism like you, Tracy, like you do. Because of the particular ways in which my embodiment is raced and how anti-Black racism inhabits US American space as something that is always known, easily known, and, and always very simple. Um, I think that sentiment is perhaps more about declaring distance from Blackness and more about claiming Euro-centered whiteness, even as one bears the mantle of decolonial studies. But this book, this book defies such convoluted hypocrisies. This book teaches us about race and multiple processes of racialization, primarily, though not exclusively, related to Asia, especially Asia Pacific and Asian American histories as the heart of the post-colonial theology project, as the heart of the post-colonial theology project. Dr. Kwok insists that we understand racial imperialism in the study, in the study of religion, racial imperialism in the study of religion. In some ways, this text is a model of intellectual history charting scholarly developments from pioneers such as Said and Spivak and Baba to institutional innovations such as the Pacific Asian North American Asian Women in Theology and Ministry Conferences. And finally, as one always finds in Dr. Clark's work, there is attention to practices, attention to and examples of practices and examples of playful practices. And I just wanna give one example of one of my favorites and that is the self-interview. And as a means of doing this work as a living tradition. And so one example of the self-interview, uh, uh, the, the question, um, quote, the question, then why do the Americans have to search for origins? The answer from Dr. Kwok doing the self-interview, quote, the straight ma white males in America have made a lot of noises saying that they have lost a lot of ground to women, minorities, and gays, and lesbians, the mass media in the US has played up the angry white male syndrome. Whenever 
the white males are not certain about their identity, they search for Jesus, unquote. I want to emphasize this text teaches me, it teaches us how to unravel imperialist logics with incisively critical and gracious, generous, playfully dialogical engagement with scholars on how we can craft political theology in the academy and in the church that is unabashedly anti-racist. Thank you, Dr. Kwok. Well, Dr. West, thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. I think you so beautifully capture not only the, the rich uh, intellectual substance of the book, but also the disposition from which Dr. Kwok writes, which is uh, generous and constructive at every turn. So thank you for that. And just as a quick reminder to those others in the room, please continue to feel, feel free to submit your questions and comments to us in the chat. We are keeping an ongoing list of those questions and we will get them uh, to Dr. Kwok and our respondents uh, in just a few moments. But for now, let me turn to our second respondent this evening, uh, which is Dr. Nami Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim is Professor of Religious Studies and Chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Spelman College here in Atlanta. She is the author of Gendered Politics of the Korean Christian Right and co-editor of Feminist Praxis Against U.S. Militarism, as well as Critical Theology Against U.S. Militarism in Asia. Uh, Dr. Kim, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. West. Um, it is a great joy for me to join Dr. Kwok's book lunch, along with Dr. Tracy West, who I dearly respect, and everyone who has joined virtually across time zones and spaces. Whose Colonial Politics and Theology is a book that I have been waiting for in this historical moment. I will share my appreciation and excitement for Dr. Kwok's timely, comprehensive, and generative book by briefly mentioning only three, only three interrelated points pertaining to my teaching and scholarship. I approach my comments as someone who first crossed the Pacific Ocean as an adult from the divided Korea to the US and is currently teaching at a liberal arts college for women of African descent, working at the intersections of transnational feminist theology and Asian and Asian North American religious and theological studies. My first point is about theoretical intervention. By crossing disciplinary boundaries and making theoretical intervention in doing theology, Dr. Kwok articulates a post-political theology from a post-colonial and comparative approach in such a way that its scopes, contents, and tasks challenge and go beyond the confines of Eurocentric modern political theology. Such political theology is formed and generated in the midst of people's struggles, addressing the multidimensional aspects of post-colonial politics. Theoretical intervention through the engagement with post-colonial theory that stands in the tradition of resistance post-colonialism, transnational theory that defies the methodological nationalism, decolonial theory, intersectional feminism, among others, is a testament to the importance of theoretical frameworks in knowledge production, for they provide lens through which we, including my millennial students, can make sense of the logics that run through seemingly unrelated forms of destruction and violence wrought by colonial and imperial forces so that we can pursue different ways of living through the engagement with such knowledge. Recently, a student in my class literally shouted with excitement as she was presenting her research project on the ways US media perpetuate gendered Islamophobia from a transnational, post-colonial, and feminist perspective. She said, Dr. Kim, 
I now understand why theoretical framework is so important. For her, my other and future student, Dr. Guap's discussion of religious difference as opposed to religious pluralism in colonial and post-colonial situations, her post-colonial critique of the concept of religion and the separation of religion and the secular and its accompanying binaries will be indispensable in assisting my students to connect the dots and to recognize how they themselves are also implicated in the complex web of Christian dominance, American exceptionalism, gendered racial formation, and US global military hegemony. Such recognition will further help them to re-examine what it means to be ethically engaged global citizens as US educated women of color when the majority of the world's people are still living in the post-colonial realities that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. My second point is about Dr. Kwok's charge to feminist theologians of Asian descent who speak within Asia and in between Asia and North America. She gives us charge to generate transnational feminist theologies, particularly on the ways globalization is reshaping Asia Pacific where US military dominance, China's ascendancy as economic and military power, and other sub-empires coexist, sometimes mutually reinforcing and other times competing. Her charge affirms my earlier articulation of a critical global feminist theology and challenges me to reconceptualize power, especially divine power when we are witnessing marginalized people standing at the forefront of multiple global resistance movements. Dr. Kwok's suggested image of a God of the interstitious is particularly formative in that it allows us not to give the totalizing power to the imperial, but to form transborder resistance and planetary solidarity by making cracks, fissures, and holes in the seemingly incontestable and unchanging matrix of power structures. My last point is about imagination. Dr. Kwok's book stretches our imagination epistemologically and broadens our moral and political imagination by making a post-colonial turn in political theology. She says that post-colonial theology functions as a training of the imagination. Political theology then demands us to unlearn and undo what we have been doing, including theological writings that are so accustomed to what Dr. Kwok calls the tyranny of common sense. Such a theology also helps us to nurture what she calls habits of thought that challenge dominant religious imaginaries and imperialist social and political orders. Her book does not stop there, but urges us to shift our value system that is entrenched in anthropocentrism, extractive capitalism, heteropatriarchal colonial worldviews to the ones that can sustain the environment and the earth community, which we are all part of. In her 2005 book, Postcolonial Imagination and Feminist Theology, Dr. Kwok wrote, quote, by documenting my critical engagement with postcolonial thought, I hope to create a little more space to imagine that an alternative world and a different system of knowledge are possible, close quote. She has widened such a space in her new book and has extended an invitation to us so that we too can participate in the process of collectively imagining a different world by unleashing the creative power of post-colonial imagination beyond the confines of the Western or Westernized institutions, because no one can do it alone. Thank you, Dr. Kwa, for sharing your transformative scholarship that is unapologetically lived through your teaching, activism, mentoring, spiritual practice, and sharing of the meals. Congratulations again.
Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kim, for adding your reflections and thoughts on this book and how it intersects with your work as a teacher and a scholar. We're so grateful for that. Uh, now we're going to turn to the part of the evening where we're going to open the conversation more broadly to all of those uh, who are here with us this evening. Some of you have been submitting questions through the chat and we have them and we'll begin there. You can continue to submit questions or comments through the chat. You can raise your digital hand or you can wave your actual hand and uh, give us a second if you're doing it that way because we have to scroll through a couple different screens to see everyone, but we will find you and we would love to make space for your uh, for your comment. So I wanna begin with the first question that we had uh, from just a little while ago. And Carly asks, uh, her question is, who can write post-colonial theology? She says, while, I'm a, while I am transgender, I am also white and at the center of empire here in the U.S. I am writing a paper on post-colonial John for class, and this question is uppermost in my mind. And so, Dr. Kwok, I will direct these questions to you, but Dr. West and Dr. Kim, you're welcome to jump in uh, as well. Thank you very much, Carly, for your wonderful question. Who can write post-colonial theology? I think post-colonial theology needs to be contributed by many people. Why? Because when Hong Kong was colonized for over 150 some years, we were asking, what did the British theologians had to say? So soon we, thinking about in the 1920s, just 100 years ago, the majority of the world's population were under uh, colonialism. It shaped not only the colonized world, but also shaped the colonizers' world too. That is why I think for all people who are interested in how empire, colonialism, and neo-colonialism continue to shape the world, that we have a responsibility to think about what I define as this association from this colonial syndrome and imagination. And especially you identify yourself as a transgender person. That is why we need your contribution. Why in 19th century, the term homosexuality emerged at a time when the anthropologist and the medical uh, scientist were thinking about the so-called primitive people's sexual practices. And then homosexuality at that time, when they coined the term and thought about it, they were thinking that this was not mature way of sexuality, almost harken back to the primitive era. Can you see that? And so with that kind of intercession, we welcome your particular contribution to look at how the construction of sexuality upheld then and continues to uphold white hegemony and misogyny and certainly other forms of oppression as well. I do not subscribe to the thought that only formerly colonized people can do post-colonial theology. It is not identity politics. It is a political option and political vision. Thank you, Dr. Kwok, for that. And thank you for the question again. Um, a second question we have uh, is, uh, it goes like this. In the country in which I was born, colonial religions have subjected the people of the country to live in over 90% poverty and illiteracy for over 500 years. Uh, this is, is a serious issue in this context. How should I use the same religion to defeat poverty and illiteracy? Now this, I want um, to hear also from uh, Tracy or Nami, because this is really a very important question. That is how to address poverty and literacy. It has a gender dimension, isn't it? When we look at poor country, who are the people who will be going without education? Usually women and girls. I want to invite later Dr. West to respond because she has done a lot of research on that issue as well. Now the question said, colonial religion, I do not know what form 
that colonial religion is. Speaking from Christianity that I know a little bit more, obviously colonialism from the European countries went hand in hand with missionaries and the uh, uh, colonial education supported by uh, missionary enterprise. Today, I talk about decolonizing our mind because that form of education put us in a position to model, to emulate, to value Western ideas and theories to the extent that we have lost our own confidence or our own cultural footing or autonomy. To address the problem of poverty, we need to look at class. But it's not just class alone. It is class in the midst of all the intersexuality of different axes of power. And without looking that as a whole, you single out just one thing, religion, okay? Whether it's colonial religion or other forms of religious practices will not address the whole very complex situation. I wonder if Dr. West would like to join me uh, to give some insights to this very important question. Um, mainly just to uh, underscore what you've um, already articulated and to just really express my appreciation for the ways in which you, you, you hit several points about, and especially this last point about looking at these, these intersecting and codependent supports for um, maintaining this system of um, poverty, keeping people poor, and these global systems that they're so they're so um, intersecting, uh, and also the role of uh, I I always like to include the role of of violence um, and st state violence as well as as is intimate violence and the ways in which those reinforce one another, whether through military means or whether police actions, et cetera, um, that, that also um, in, in many ways create this, um, <laughs> they enforce, they enforce the rules of religion, religious tolerance um, and support and nurturing of the domination. Um, mm -hmm. As well as uh, as well as illiteracy, um, so so I'm just agreeing with you on those intersections, but I am going to stop because there are a lot of really wonderful questions that um, it would be great to hear more of your responses to, especially some uh, questions about China. If I just may uh, add one thing, um, the Western colonialism didn't end but instead it was, has been successfully succeeded by neo-colonialists, especially in Asia Pacific, which means there are neo-colonialists in the metropolis, you know, many different you know, cities in Asia Pacific who shares interests and this imperialist desire with those who are in the West. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, and also those elite includes religious you know, leaders, whatever religion you are referring to. So that's why I think we really need this transnational and post-colonial critique of ongoing colonization. It mutates its form. So we need to really pay attention to the ways in which this, you know, multiple forms of power structure intersect instead of separating religion or, you know, economy as a, you know, unrelated entities. Great point. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Yeah, Thank excellent. You. Thank you for all, th uh, all three of you. Um, a question that I think follows closely on this thread, David asks uh, you, Dr. Kwok, do you theorize China as empire? Uh, and David says, I raised this question with respect to the Hong Kong protest and China's global outreach, especially in Africa. Yes, I think that this is a very important question. Um, China, the name means Middle Kingdom, has always positioned itself at the center of the universe, okay? And then um, do I call um, China an empire? It has been a China, an empire 
you need to talk to the people in Vietnam to and talk to people in Korea to understand that in imperial formation. It may not be exactly the same way as European colonization. But today, we must begin to articulate not the Chinese empire and American empire. We must begin to address Sino-American empire. The two on surface mm. competing, but our world today would not have been formed without symbiotic relationship between the two. Now we are entering a different phase of that symbiotic relations. The old model did not work. That is, China was the factory of the world and American as consumers bought cheap products from China. China wants to change its economic uh, landscape and then competing on technology, on many other things, cyberspace and, uh, and uh, also the outer space. And today we are seeing keen competition on different fronts, but it is important to recognize not just political rhetorics, but the economic substratum. I do not think that it is so easy just to separate. This is Chinese interest. This is American interest. Sometimes the two overlapped. Sometimes they competed against each other. But from my own post-colonial perspective, I want to tease out more in what way symbiotically they formed a new two great powers to dominate the rest of the world, including uh, in the uh, business and also other sectors in Africa and in Latin America too. Great, thank you, Dr. Kwok. Um, there are so many good questions here, friends, and I'm, we're, we're grateful for you, the way you have thoughtfully shared. Um, another one I wanna put before you, Dr. Kwok, is, is this one from Rose. Uh, Rose asks, how does post-colonial theology critique the rising number of dictatorships that are so prevalent in the world today and that pose a threat to universal values of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law instead of just focusing on the Western domination? Yes, dictatorship or domination takes many different forms. It is not just we have European empires. We have the Ottoman Empire, remember that. Um, we then have uh, various empires in Asia as well. So I think we need a transnational and very really comparative political uh, theology to talk about the changing landscape of world politics. So we are not just focusing on one form of imperial formation, mostly Western, but other formations as well. Dictatorship can also be found in small countries. It's not just in big empires. And so we need to have the kind of global horizon, but also very concrete historical and local analysis. Excellent. Um, we're coming up on the nine o'clock, but I want to see if we can get in just one or two other quick questions. Um, one is from Jay, and Jay asks, uh, says, I am grateful for this great opportunity to listen to Dr. Kwok, Dr. West, and Dr. Kim. Jay says, many of us are a product of white dominant uh of the white dominant academy, which has deep roots from the Western world, history, and education. As you imagine to unwind and undo it, uh, I find that we still use Western academic tools to do this work of deconstructing the West. So how can we imagine to overcome and free ourselves from colonial and white dominant Western academic influence? Can I just begin and then I will invite Nami and also uh, Tracy to respond. Well, it takes my lifetime, isn't it? This is the 50th anniversary of my theological journey. I started in college in 1971 to study theology. And it takes a long time why precisely what the question uh, talks about. 
That is, we have gone through a very long colonial apprenticeship. That is, our thinking model, our language, our rhetoric have been so influenced by hegemony, defined by a Western knowledge system. And so to dissociate ourselves or seeking to decolonize the mind is a very vigorous exercise. Each one of us needs to plot our own intellectual trajectory. And not all Western knowledge is bad. I always tell the students, you have to creatively critique what you have inherited, but you need to create a space to think otherwise. So I asked my other two colleagues uh, to contribute their wisdom. Um, all right, I'll just say something quickly because I wanna make sure I get in, um, Dr. Kim. I just wanna say, um, where is the knowledge? Who, who are you listening to? Who are you talking to? Who do you, where, where, where do you assume that knowledge is located? And for me in my own journey, uh, it's been crucial to understand this dialogical project has got to include um, folks that are working at, folks who are illiterate, who are extremely poor and, and not just listening to their struggle, listening to their intellectual innovativeness and letting that reflect back and critique my own intellectual methods and patterns and approaches. And so it's in that dialogue, it's in that understanding that knowledge exists in those, in that, those encounters. And that has to be part of the decolonial process, that, that process of being in conversation and also, and also um, allowing that critique to occur. And especially, I wanna say, breaking down some of the, our, our understandings of, of gender hierarchy, uh, sex and gender hierarchy. Um, I, I mean, I agree with uh, Dr. Kwok and Dr. Trace. I mean, West everything. Uh, so if I just add, I, I see the, you know, the importance of this question definitely. And it's not just those of us who are in the West, actually even the academic institutions and many institutions in non-Western context have been Westernized. So I don't think we can really find so-called pure space where all knowledge are liberating automatically. As you know, Dr. West has said, it's a process. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes, it's painful, but something we have to do. So I, you know, we have to, there are, you know, the knowledge, knowledge production, it's not just an individual thing either. You know, it's, it has a whole industry, right? So if we think of it as a totalizing power, it can be very depressing and you know it can be just it, it feels like there's no end out but there are always cracks and fissures and holes and there are you know scholars in the west and westernized institutions who do the work of decolonizing so i think we need to find those voices and those writings and also we need to think about how do we write and not only about the content and how do we write. It's a, I mean, it's a difficult, you know, conversation. But I just wanted to put the, put that out there. Yeah. Excellent. Um, these questions are so good. Um, I want to squeeze one last one in, uh, it, it, Dr. Kwok, if you could answer it quickly. Um, it, I want to end on a message of hope or a question about hope, at least. Um, uh, the question reads: Does the post-colonial hope that you spoke of um, only have an eschatological dimension? Um, speaking of embodying it, what does it mean to embody a post-colonial hope? I'm wondering if you might be able to answer that very briefly for us. I know it's a big question. Oh, if you could, uh, you're still yes, muted. I Dr. remember yeah. Jesus always said, it is the kingdom of God is here, but also not yet, isn't it? And so we cannot just wait for the eschaton for our hope. Hope is a daily practice. I drink a cup of tea. I take care of myself. That is the embodiment of my hopefulness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much, friends. This has been uh, an enriching 
and constructive conversation. We're so grateful for each of you who have been here, who have shared your time and your comments and your questions with us. To Dr. West and Dr. Kim, thank you for being such generous and constructive respondents. Uh, we learned so much from just hearing you reflect on Dr. Kwok's book. So we are grateful for your time. And Dr. Kwok, uh, for you and for what you've given us in this volume, um, we are so incredibly grateful. Um, as our evening closes, I want to extend a special invitation to everyone who is here uh, to continue these sorts of conversations through some offerings that we have through the Candler Foundry. One of the programs that that Dr. Kwok has been connected to through the Candler Foundry is called Courses in the Community. Uh, these are courses taught by Candler fac uh, faculty and other scholars from throughout the world, and they aim to make seminary level learning available to everyone. Uh, and they do so through courses that are four to 12 weeks long that connect in-depth reflection on scripture and theology and ethics and all sorts of things to the questions and challenges facing churches in the world today. Uh, the great thing about these courses is that they are very inexpensive, no application is required, and there are no tests or papers at the end. So this is a way to engage your mind and your faith without some of the normal trappings of formal degree programs. We have uh, several amazing courses coming up, uh, really just in about a month. Um, Dr. Kwok herself is teaching a 12-week course on spirituality for the contemporary world. It's on Wednesday night, starting at 7.30 on January 12th. Dr. Gail Yi, who is with us this evening, uh, is teaching a six-week course on women in the Hebrew Bible. And that's on Mondays at 7.30 as well, starting on January 10th. And Dr. Timothy Tseng is offering a six-week course on Christianity in Asian American history on Mondays at 8 p.m. All of these times are Eastern, uh, beginning after Easter. There are, this is just a taste of a number of the courses that we offer through the Candler Foundry. So we invite you uh, to check out these courses if you simply go to candlerfoundry.emory. Uh, .edu. Um, I think that e uh, the web address is there in the chat for you. You can uh, search all of the courses that we have. You can sign up for the various ones I've named, but also other ones. And as a special thank you for coming tonight, we're putting through to you in the chat um, a coupon code to give you 50% off any of our courses that you can use that code through this Friday. We'll also send it out to you along with more information about our courses in a follow-up email on Thursday. So we do hope you might be able to join us for some of our courses in the community, either with Dr. Yi, uh, Dr. Kwok, or many of the other instructors that we have. Uh, friends, the hour is growing late, or maybe it's just growing early for you, depending on where you are. So I want to uh, offer one final thanks and a good evening and a good morning to each of you. We're so grateful for you being here. And uh, remember to buy Dr. Kwok's book with the coupon code that we sent out earlier. Friends, it's been a delight and, and thank a joy. thank you too. And thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.